नमस्ते एवरीवन वेलकम टू द चार वर्क पॉडकास्ट दिस इज योर होस्ट कुशल मेहरा सो इट्स बीन मोर ऑलमोस्ट अ मंथ आई डोंट नो एग्जैक्टली द नंबर ऑफ डेज दैट आई डिड अ मोनोलॉग बट इट्स बीन अ वाइल इट्स जस्ट दैट वन ऑफ दोस थिंग्स दैट आई वाज टू बिजी रिकॉर्डिंग डिस्कशंस विद डिफरेंट पीपल एंड अनफॉर्चूनेटली इन बिटवीन बिकॉज वेन एवर आई डू अ मोनोलॉग uh it's people might find it hard to believe i find doing a book podcast much easier than doing a monologue because for me doing a monologue involves so much reading and uh, so much cross referencing going through articles old articles new articles surveys polls papers books that i end up uh, taking way more time to design a monologue so i was just not in a position to do it and i also unfortunately had dengue so i landed in india on the 24th of october and in two days of landing i got dengue and i was just out for two weeks and then this thing got delayed even more and i just was not able to do it but today then i got a f- bit of a free spot and i had research for this monologue which i had intended to do almost 3 weeks ago today and um, i was like oh what the hell today i have this slot available in the podcast so might as well go for it but before i start uh, my monologue i once again want to uh, tell everyone how to support the charvak podcast as you know this podcast is not an advertisement driven podcast but a member driven podcast what do i mean when i say it is a member driven podcast basically this podcast runs monetarily on a very simple model the on youtube or patreon or fanmo there is an option of you to become a member of this podcast so if you go and click and join any of the two tiers the seekers tier or the speak with me tier you monetarily support this podcast and that's how this podcast runs now my channel i'm not saying i am the biggest channel but i have a decent size of subscribers i even have a decent rating on spotify i could get ads but i don't do ads is because they always come with a caveat that you can't talk about this issue because this is too sensitive for the brand and i'm not complaining about the brands per se or you can't criticize this company because this company is associated with this brand and we don't want to so i was like you know i don't want to get into this drama i'll just do what i do in fact even today's topic that i intend to talk about is a very sensitive issue and it might hurt a few sentiments on the muslim side on the hindu side on the christian side on the left wing side on the right wing side whatever i don't know and most brands don't want to be associated with stuff like this so once again if you want to support this podcast please do by becoming a member there are two tiers one is the seekers tier one is the speak with me tier on the seekers tier you get access to the entire gamut of discussion of the aryan invasion aryan migration out of india theory hypotheses and you can check papers book discussions and finally the rigveda right now we are in the seventh mandala of the rigveda so if you guys really want to support the podcast you can go and support the podcast by joining the seekers tier or if you have a little more money and you want to support the podcast even more you can join the speak with me tier under the speak with me tier you get the benefits of the seekers tier plus you get once a month a chance to hang out with me digitally um no recording nothing you just ask your questions i will answer them to the best of my ability um and uh, over and above that there is another bunch of content where we discuss religion we've already completed the entire valmiki ramayana chapter by chapter verse by verse and also we are discussing the manuskriti i think we are all we are done with the 8th chapter of the manuskriti now 9 10 11 12 if i remember correctly four more chapters are left and then the manuskriti will be completed too and then we'll you know jump on to another religious text of the hindu pantheon so these are the things you can do if you will support the podcast it helps this podcast to survive but before that i want to thank all the people in the last one month who did experiment with the with the membership uh, program so hen, on patreon it was henil patel uh, thank you very much for join, joining and jayveer choudhury uh, and raviram mamidi who joined on fanmo we had harshal munwar i think nikhil sinha shrikant satyanarayana um, let me see if i'm missing someone else yeah vanna mehra um, yep these are uh, the new members on fanmo and then i come to youtube where uh, <clears throat> you had anurag reddy you had abhay khandelwal atal purohit um, abhimanyu chauhan kavya bhat rahul agarwal pragati john connor yeah, john connor um kushal pratap 
who else uh, shiva kami rajagopal then you have uh, pragyan singh harsha sachin venugopal chumma kati kafir tomatoer okay tomatoer bhi kafir hote hain mujhe nahi pata tha sid dave anjul singh pravit nair 1NT19IS049. Okay, that's literally the name. So I can't do anything. So these are all the new members. Once again, thank you very much for supporting the Charvak podcast through your membership efforts. And uh, really, I, I truly appreciate your support. And uh, it would not have been possible without all of you and your support. I have an announcement for the Speak With Me tier members. I'm not going to announce it in this podcast. Uh, maybe in the next monologue next month i have a special announcement especially for the speak with me tier members i will announce it uh, i i want some things to be in order before i do that so now let's talk about the monologue of the day now why did i call it all cultures are not equal this is the, i i've been kind of you know i did a monologue in the past talking about objective morality and objective moral standards uh, i i did a podcast with haris sultan which was streamed on both my channel and his channel which was uh, discussing islamism in the west and on and off I, i've spoken about the issue um, in, in you know i've made lines here and there when when i was discussing the israel hamas conflict uh, with uh, daniel boardman or when i discuss pakistan or pakistani politics or pakistani society with sushan sarin or many other people for that matter even with haris but this discussion is way more than that this discussion is like a cumulative collection of everything that i hear everything that i feel about about a, a lot that goes on around us right we we often talk about uh, first of all you have to understand one simple reality that we live in a globalized world whether we like it or not this is our new baseline you may not like this new baseline as i don't know whether you like it or not i'm not assuming on your behalf to the listener on the view or the viewer on youtube i'm not making any assumption on your behalf but all i'm stating is this is the new reality that we live in in, in a very uh, globalized world we live in a world where even if we don't like it right even if not physically digitally you're going to be forced to deal with people of different cultures react to different cultures understand different cultures and since the 1960s onwards the world has been going through a very diff- different journey i mean the liberal world order uh, which is pretty much dominated by the united states of america along with other western european nations liberalism and the far you know the liberal world order basically the idea of free markets open immigration people coming in people going out and all these things uh, have been pretty much accepted as the baseline or were accepted as the baseline uh, i i should be more precise here were accepted as the baseline now there is opposition to it in different ways but behind all of this was an assumption was an assumption what was that assumption the assumption was that the world was going away from nationalism nationalism in the european sense not in the indian sense for my indian listeners before you think are hum to nationalist hai what you call nationalism in india and what is nationalism in the european union for that matter or in the united states of america is chalk and cheese so you have to understand when you talk about nationalism you talk about patriotism in the western sense but when westerners talk about nationalism they talk about it in a very different sense so you try and understand that nuance because i have a western listener base so i guess this this kind of clarifies uh, things for both the east the indian listeners and the western listeners that um, india having a colonial past right these things matter for us so we're never going to be a society which just says oh yeah this open sh- shut up and let people in it's not going to happen like that we have a, f- a tremendous trauma associated with people ad- entering our society so we are going to be doubly sure because the last time people entered our society it did not end up well for us at least in the last 1500 years uh really shit went down that we did not like it the way it went down 
so india has a trauma associated with it, it still doesn't mean that india is not an open society india has open despite a lot of these things but the west definitely in the last 50 years has truly opened its society but what was the baseline under which the western society decided to open what was the epistemic framework what was the ideology under which the west justified opening up its society basically that of the ideology was multiculturalism when the liberal world order basically won and liberal values won, free trade won, capitalism won, the whole idea was that you're going to have people coming back and forth from one society to the other. And now you're not going to live in homogenous silos. You're going to live in societies where different people of different ethnicities and different backgrounds are going to come together, live under one land mass. And to justify all of that, sociology basically came up with the theory of multiculturalism. Now, what were the key takeaways of culture, uh, multiculturalism? I think Thought.co has pretty much uh, summarized that very well. As you guys know, I'm a stickler for references. So I always like to, uh, you know, me pretending to have all the thoughts and showing how smart I am, although I may even say the same thing. It's always better for me to read things so that you also know where I read it from. See, I do my monologues like I write an essay. So I always like to share my references, right? So I hope you appreciate my effort to be transparent with you. There's no other reason that I do these things with you. So I, I, I loved these three bullet points that were mentioned on thoughtco.com slash what is culturalism. I, why am I repeating the, <laughs> the link? Because, you know, this is going to go on the audio platform also. So for you audio listeners, thought, thoughtco.com. And the key takeaways of multiculturalism was multiculturalism is the way in which a society deals with cultural diversity, both at the national and at a community level. Sociologically, multiculturalism assumes that society as a whole benefits from increased diversity through the harmonious coexistence of different cultures. Multiculturalism typically develops according to one of the two theories, the melting pot theory and the salad bowl theory. Now, this is the most important point. Today, we are going to talk about these two theories. It's very important to talk about these two theories. And, and it's just a coincidence that a person like me, I was lucky by sheer luck. It's just by sheer coincidence that uh, I have family in the United States of America and I got married to someone who stays in Canada. So I actually could experience these two theories live in action. The United States of America is often associated with the melting pot theory and Canada is associated with the salad bowl theory. These two countries, these two neighbors, North American neighbors, who don't fight with each other, by the way, have very different ways of operating internally when it comes to multiculturalism. I'm not going to get into Europe. I'm not going to get into the United Kingdom. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that is that I don't understand those societies as well. I've not lived there. I understand the United States of America and Canada now reasonably well. I've lived there now. I've been living there for a few months back to back now. And I've lived there in the past. So I am more familiar with that society, which is why I took these two as an example. And I want to take it all. And then I will end up with India, which is the society I understand far better than even North America. But I'm just giving you these perspectives. I, and so please bear with me. Now, there's a very interesting paper that I, I had read a while ago, which is, uh, again, I'm just showcasing this with you. You can, if you have a JSTOR membership, you can go and download this paper very well. This is the paper. It is by Hassan Aydin. It is called A Critical Literary Review of the Melting Pot and a Salad Bowl Assimilation and Integration Theories. The author was Mohammed Bere. The source is the Journal of Ethnic and Cultural Studies, June 2019, Volume 6. All right. So what is the origin of these theories is very important. And I'm going to read you the origin. So let's start with the melting pot theory and what the paper says. So the melting pot theory first rose to prominence in 1782 where Hector St. John de Krebeck, Seor, I don't know how to pronounce this, bhai mere naam nahi hai, ye log bhi mere naam nahi he was from France and he described the demographic homogeneity of the United States as comprising, quote, individuals of all nations melted into a new race of men whose neighbor, labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. 
In his view, Americans are Western pilgrims who carry with them industrial skills from the East and will finish the great circle of their pilgrimage in the United States. So this was one. Then almost a century later in 1845, Rolf Waldo Emerson, a poet who led the American transcendentalist movement of the mid 19th century, expanded on St. John's uh, theory by describing America as, quote, the utopian product of a culturally and racially mixed melting pot. In 1875, an article by Titus Munson Cohn in his attempt to describe the smelting process of becoming an American introduced the melting pot theory as the fusion of individualities, including any traits of immigrant religion and race, down a blast furnace in a, quote, democratic alembic like chips of brass in a melting pot. So what are these different people talking about when they talk about the melting pot theory? Essentially, what a melting pot theory is, is like a bowl, right? And you keep adding ingredients to the bowl. And they keep melting inside the bowl. They add their own flavor in the bowl. Right? But the bowl remains by and large the same. So what is America? America is like this melting pot where Indians will come, Chinese will come, Koreans will come, uh, you know, Muslims will come, Hindus will come, Jews will come. They all carry their unique thing. But there is this overarching, you know, idea of American exceptionalism or Americanism or whatever they want to call it. And you merge in that. Now, that is the melting pot theory. But the salad bowl theory is something very different. Now, let us read the salad bowl theory, right? So, let's go there. All right. So the salad bowl theory starts in the 1960s. A new vision of American pluralism arose metaphorically similar to the salad bowl. Compared to the melting pot, the salad bowl maintains the unique identities of individuals that would otherwise be lost to assimilation. The immediate advantage of salad bowl theory is that it acknowledges the discrete identities and cultural differences of a multicultural society. This appreciation from the individual contributions of each ethnic group of society to society transcends the overarching ascent of the dominant culture at the expense of imperceptible minority groups. Contrary to the melting pot theory where the identity and influence of dominant ethnic group prevails regardless of the transformation resulting from the assimilation and cultural morphology, the salad bowl retains the individuality and independence of ethnic groups and permits their existence side by side dominant culture. This removes the pressure to create homogenous identities in the melting pot theory, especially since such homogenous identities are not representative in equal proportion to their constituent identities. The salad bowl theory, given its shortcomings, provides more integrative possibilities. This is the opinion of the author. This is not a theoretical view. But uh, this is, in fact, when I lived in Canada or I even still live in Canada, this is essentially what Canada is based on. So what does Canada do? Yes, please come into our country. Please stay here. But if you ask a Canadian, what is a unique Canadian identity? I can guarantee you they cannot answer that. They don't know what is uniquely Canadian because they have completely immersed themselves that there is no grand Canadian vision. There is just no grand identity. We all live in our silos. And like America, because if you ask an American, that what is something uniquely American, they will be like, oh, we have the Bill of Rights, we have the First Amendment, we have the Second Amendment, we have capitalism, we have individualism. They, they will state these things to you. You forget the, the crazy woke person on TikTok. You go and talk to an average American on the street, they will rat out these seven to ten answers on the spot if you talk to them. You do the flip side of that, you go across the border, you drive to Canada or you fly in Canada and you ask Canadians the question who are practicing this melting pot theory and you ask them this question that what is uniquely Canadian? You know, they will come up with absurd answers like, I, I guess, poutine, uh, ice hockey or uh, I mean, they just say the most absurd things when you ask them at a cultural level, like what are uniquely Canadian ideas? And they are truly clueless when you ask them. Once again, there are some members over here who are Canadian. You can ask them that can you, when they ask Canadians how confused the Canadians are. And it's sad. But what I'm trying to say is, basically, 
the american way and the canadian way are distinctly different which is why canada has a unique set of problems america has another set of problems both theories now this or the author of this paper may love the melting pot theory now that's the author's opinion but i clearly shared the oh, paper openly with you is because i wanted you to know that there are theoretical perspectives when it comes to multiculturalism multiculturalism is truly based on these two broad narratives and these are deep studies done in uh, social sciences about these theories how they work out i believe the canadian experiment is flawed i believe the melt uh, you know the melting pot theory when compared to the salad bowl theory is far more superior when compared to the salad bowl theory the melting pot theory has its own problems by itself i'm not saying that but now having given you a theoretical framework of what's happening right now now let us maybe get into you know the 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 nitty gritties of this now i want to touch about the core issue now why is you know somebody might ask that why do canadians especially canadians believe in the melting pot theory now that should be the natural question that you should have when you you know think about this large or think out loud about this that hang on why are the canadians like saying ki you come here you live together but you are all different so what's the point of living together if we are all different uh, are there differences yes should we handle differences yes but to what degree the core of it is because see all theories are based on frameworks on cultural axioms just like mathematics is also based on mathematical axioms cultural theories are based on certain assumptions from where they stem at the root of the canadian salad bowl theory or the salad bowl theory itself is the idea of cultural relativism at the root of the melting pot theory is the idea of cultural objectivism i definitely believe that people who believe in the melting pot theory actually believe in objective standards and the people who subscribe to the salad bowl theory are cultural relativists now you might ask ki bhai what is cultural relativism which is a natural question if you are someone who has a functioning brain so let's look at the definition of cultural relativism because there are varieties of relativism and we will go to a very good authoritarian philosophical view which is the stanford uh, university philosophy department and this is what they say about cultural relativism so again i'm going to read the entire journey so what do they say the idea that norms and values are born out of conventions can be traced back to greek historian herodotus uh but it is only in the 20th century and particularly with the advent of social anthropology that cultural relativism has gained wide currency franz boas responsible for founding of social anthropology in the us claimed that the data of ethnology proved that not only our knowledge but also our emotions are the result of the form of our social life and the history of the people to whom we belong boas views became the orthodoxy of anthropology through which mj herkovitz principle of cultural relativism stating judgments are based on experience and experience is interpreted by each individual in terms of his own enculturation since those early days social anthropologists have come to develop more nuanced approaches to cultural relativism however its core tenet a claim to the equal standing of all cultural perspectives and values which co-vary with their cultural and social background has remained constant so what are those things cultural relativists justify their position by recourse to a combination of empirical conceptual and normative considerations and these are four as per stanford and this is a pretty standard academic definition and analysis these things are you know cited all the times in papers just letting you guys know so a the empirical observation that there is a significant degree of diversity in norms values and beliefs across culture and historic periods known as a descriptive relativism b an inductive argument to affect that failures in previous attempts to solve disagreements arising from a show that there are no universal criteria for adjudicating between differing world views c 
the methodological assumption that human behavior and thought carry the imprint of their cultural and social context such that biology by itself is not sufficient for explaining many of their most important features especially those with respect to which cultures differ and d the normative principle of a need for tolerance and acceptance towards other points of view which leads to the so called normative or prescriptive prescriptive cultural relativism or the positions that cultural relativism is a moral requirement so now you have to now that i have explained the theoretical understanding of cultural relativism as per academic standards now let us look at why the salad bowl theory is relativist as you understand the salad bowl theory literally functions in the cultural relativist realm which basically says that our society has no norms we have no grand narrative so every culture that comes in our society even though in the form of an individual because they end up forming societies their culture is equally good their culture is equally valid and their culture is good valid relevant and they have nothing problematic in them so whatever they do they do we don't care which is why the salad bowl theory is very dangerous the melting pot theory on the other hand says you you are welcome in my society please come no problem but there are certain principles that i have that are just not negotiable and we are not going to adjust to that you come and adjust to my culture i will not budge 1% so while the melting pot theory is supremely rigid the salad bowl theory has no principles at all uh, the salad bowl theory is literally a principle less theory in my opinion the best answer to this is what i call is the indian version which i is which i like to call the khichdi theory unlike the melting pot or the salad bowl the khichdi is a unique dish i don't know if it is only indian or it's outside india too i could care less about the origin of khichdi also i'm just looking at india as the ideal answer in this sense to both the melting pot and the salad bowl theory but what is the khichdi theory see to look at the texture of the khichdi it is somewhat like a melting pot but it is also somewhat like a salad Just, just imagine. Close your eyes. I, I want you. Even though you are watching me, it's not like my face is amazing. If you are watching this on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or if you are listening to this on Spotify or Audible or wherever you are, close your eyes. Imagine a salad bowl. Imagine a melting pot, and then imagine a khichdi. I think culture. should be a khichdi why because it's kind of like a melting pot it has certain core right it has a core to it it does where everything blends in but it is not absolutely rigid and everything that comes in in the form of the vegetables right you add those vegetables to the khichdi look one of the most amazing khichdis i've had in my life is in a restaurant called thresend in bandra kurla complex in mumbai bandra east so what they do is it's like a long very expensive full disclosure very expensive i think 6000 rupees a head or something what they do is they take you through different cuisines of india and at the end of it all right it's a beautiful experience if you can afford it right at the end of the experience and you know what this idea of india being a khichdi is actually when i had food at thresend uh, I'm not even making this up. I had to immediately write it down while I was consuming food over there. So what they do is they bring a giant, you know, map of India, and on that map of India, they add different ingredients sourced from different parts of India. And when they uh, do the preparation, they prepare it in front of you. They get a ready-made bowl of uh, khichdi, dal khichdi, and then what they do is they start adding. each ingredient from different states of india so they will say oh this is from this state this is from this state this is from this state and that process you know of mixing 
eventually what happens is all the flavors of the vegetables from the different states of india they are added into the khichdi which is the solid product that is kind of putting us all together so i believe the indian khichdi model is far more superior intellectually i'm not saying indians are perfectly nailing it right now on the ground i'm not saying that india has many flaws but then so does america so does canada this is this is a discussion at an ideas level so please try and understand i'm ideating i'm throwing ideas at you and an ideas level the indian khichdi and the indian way of dealing with diversity whether linguistic diversity whether culinary diversity you know diversity of food whether ideas based diversity whether religious diversity it is fascinating why do i say all of this is because first of all and now i want to come to the last point that the world is going through a very tough time tough time in the sense of not shit has hit the roof but post social media we are forced to react to things that we would not even know about so while life in actual terms is becoming better our perception of our life is that our life is becoming worse why just because of the simple reason that in the late 2009 10 whatever that time was we had social media we had twitter we had facebook we had all these things and we started posting things that we would do in the past and just get over them the next day and nobody would care nobody would find out we started posting and recording them on social media previously you know we would have that dinky diary where we would write these things and nobody would care you know when you die somebody would pick out the diary oh this guy wrote this in his or her diary you remember those old serial killer diary or di documentaries where the only way they would understand the serial killer is if they randomly found out the diary of the serial killer now the serial killer is posting shit on facebook on twitter on youtube on all these platforms on instagram so that's the problem right so social media happened it has literally been a 13 year experiment or 14 year experiment with us it has fundamentally changed our brain and today our sense of reality has become warped the reality is that our life life could have never been better but now we are living in this age where we are grappling with so much information that has been thrown at us so we have to deal with them and and if, if that is the case might as well comment on it so in such a scenario are all cultures equal is a very natural question that we should ask ourselves if all cultures are equal it indirectly means that all values are equal right if all cultures are the same they preach the same thing they teach the same things it doesn't matter how they uh, look at x or how they look at y it should not matter right so if that is the case then how does it matter that an x person who enter society if they believe in sharia law or y person who enters society believes that brahmins are superior to shudras how does it matter right all values are the same but are they you know it's very interesting as i was looking through the pew polls and i came across this pew poll of march 2022 and let's take one objective factor so now we're going to compare two cultures indian culture and pakistani culture right well let's compare them so this was the survey how indians view gender roles in families and society right so this was published by the pew research center on march 2nd 2022 you can read the complete report so according to this a quarter of indians say there is a lot of gender discrimination then we go further southern indians more likely to see discrimination against women older and younger women report facing similar levels of gender discrimination so that has not changed 
and then obviously they break it down uh, as per religion also women in jammu and kashmir assam overall more likely to report recent gender discrimination what does that show that jammu and kashmir and assam have more of these problems that's all we can say that those societies now even if i look at it from a india level right now as per the survey andhra pradesh only 6% women say they you know have faced or reported recent gender discrimination jammu and kashmir is 35% tamil nadu just look at tamil nadu guys as per this poll it is 28% now if i was to ask an honest question on the topic of gender discrimination aren't andhra pradesh gujarat maharashtra kerala jharkhand odisha and look at the much maligned uttar pradesh it is far better than tamil nadu on this the much maligned uttar pradesh you know everybody likes to kind of shit on uttar pradesh punjab is also just there at 14% but the point is are all these states equal on this parameter a cultural relativist might say yeah they are i would say no on women's discrimination andhra pradesh is far better than jammu and kashmir assam telangana and this is the point and you know it's a beautiful survey you should go through it and and the most heartening thing over here is indians overwhelmingly say they value gender equality 80% of our general population values gender equality and favorable view of bjp 83% key figure there 83% who are bjp supporters have a favorable view 81% hindus 76% muslims 70% christians 83% sikhs 91% buddhists 83% jains you know even the age gap is not that bad college graduate less than college graduate not that bad general category lower caste so called lower caste not that bad religious irreligious difference another interesting bit over here but the point is people with a favorable view of bjp overwhelmingly say they value gender equality so the question to ask is whenever these tropes are thrown against the bjp about them being misogynistic patriarchal i'm not saying there are no misogynists no patriarchs in that system but i'm saying these are what the polls say that people who vote for bjp tend to have more liberal values they do they tend to have more liberal values compared to the and again majorities across indian states and territories want equal rights for men and women look who's at the bottom west bengal <laughs> chatisgarh 93% but look who's at the bottom west bengal now these things are very important but we're not done here so let's now flip to the other section now we did the indian culture I, i did not want to just make it all about india now i want to take a look at other cultures right this is also pew will maintain the same polling agency so that you know we have this standard now we look at a poll from april 30th 2013 chapter 4 women in society this is an analysis of societies where muslims are in majority so should women decide if they wear a veil look at the views in pakistan bangladesh afghanistan which is our area right i i don't care about the rest of the muslim world but i want to look at pakistan bangladesh afghanistan afghanistan only 30% of muslims say women should decide bangladesh 56% pakistan 70% so on the veil issue pakistan is much better than bangladesh and afghanistan that is point number 1 must a wife 
always obey her husband. Right? 94% Afghanistanis believe a wife must always obey her husband. 88% Pakistani and Bangladeshis believe a wife must always obey her husband. Now ask yourself this question. Is this a decent cultural value? Is this a superior cultural value? Is this value equal to what I showed you in India, where an overwhelming majority of Indians have now come around on the subject of gender equality, including BJP supporters, the so-called patriarchal misogynists? Look at the difference. These things matter. All cultures are not equal. Let's go further. Should a wife have the right to divorce a husband? Bangladesh, 62% say yes. Pakistan, 26% say a wife should have a right to divorce a husband. I repeat, 26%, they could not even find an answer in Afghanistan. Are these cultures equal? Are they equally valid? If you are a woman, you know, all the women in the live stream, do you think these cultures are equally valid? These values are equally relevant? Do you feel blessed that you are living in India? Or not? Think about this. Think about the data. Should sons and daughters have equal inheritance rights? 53% of Pakistan says yes. 46% of Bangladesh says yes, and 30% of Afghanistan says yes. Look at India. Hindu girls have equal inheritance rights. Muslim girls don't, even in India. Are these values equally relevant? Are these values the same? Should men and women not have equal inheritance rights? Should all women not have equal inheritance rights? just like the Hindu women of India are? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Once again, I want to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, all cultures are not equal. Some suck more. Try and understand. Again, this is another great survey. Why am I bringing these things up? Because like I said before, we are more and more living in a world where we are forced to deal with different people. And how we deal with people is going to decide the destiny of the next 100 years. Try and understand this. Now, one caveat that I do want to give you. I know that survey was from 2013. And now it is 2023, and I hope that a positive change must have happened. But it still doesn't mean that it would have come down to the Indian baseline where 80-85% people actually believe in equality. No, it would not have happened. And these things matter. You cannot go around saying that all cultures are equal. And now let us come to the main crux of the issue. In a very significant way, in the last few years, we have seen a few significant changes where Jimmy Ackerson's party, the Swedish Democrats, has come into power in Sweden. Giorgia Meloni has come to power through Fratelli di Italia in Italy. You had the guy, the anarcho-capitalist, libertarian um, coming in Argentina. I don't I, I don't remember his name. I forgot the dude's name. I'm completely blocked out on that. And then Geert Wilders with the Netherlands in the Netherlands with the Freedom Party has come into power now. Now, why are these things happening in Europe? Why? Why are these things happening in Europe? And you know what the scary part is? In Germany, now that should scare the shit out of you. The Germany's alternative for Deutschland is this close to being politically relevant for the German central right to forcibly concede to form a coalition with them? This is how 
close even real world far right parties are to power in europe but the question you should be asking is not just that why are these people winning the question you should be asking is what led to this what led to the situation what led to the situation where people are becoming so fed up so fed up of every single thing like i'll give you an example right sweden just now just now sweden has started a crackdown on mosques right now the swedish government so i was reading a news report um in what is happening in sweden it, it's a website called aa.com where uh, swedish so might as well share it with all of you so the report is sweden banning islamic schools despite many being among the best performing schools in the country the swedish government continues to close down islamic academic institutions in a bid to push quote anti islamic rhetoric and stop privatization in education basically uh the reality is that sweden has a right of center government and these people have had enough of islamism and their response is we're going to shut things down in fact i was reading a report that a 24 year old woman was apparently unfortunately killed in a massive bombing uh, near her house and now the the swedish government has i think has decided to offer military assistance now and it's it's sad and sweden's reacting the way it, i did not hope they would react but it is what it is it has come down to this and this is not going to stop look at the case of uh, what's happening uh, in ireland right now and you know what scares the most is there is a particular image that is circulating on irish um, social media right now so i don't know if you guys know conor mcgregor is from ireland he is one of the most or if not the biggest superstar of mma in this world and this photo is actually circulating right now on irish social media for the audio listeners it's conor mcgregor in the front holding a gun and a bunch of irishmen behind him with irish flags holding a gun and it's it's not nice i can assure you because these things never end well never they never end well no matter what people want to say these things always end up bad but why are they the way they are now i i don't know how to say this but the the response from the irish government to the riots that have happened in ireland is crazy so the irish government inst instead of cracking down on islamism in a correct way right <laughs> they decided in their wisdom to come up with probably the worst hate speech law that you could imagine in human history i mean the things that the hate speech laws if they come are going to basically allow should scare the shit out of you like this is exactly what they're trying in india by the way exactly literally who ba who uh which uh, nikhil and i have covered on the podcast in the law commission report you know a lot of people uh, free speech haters this is what is coming for you in india also by the way so just check this shit out so offense of preparing or possessing material likely to incite violence or hatred against persons on account of their protected characteristics this is where they say this is their definition of that particular thing just i'm just leaving it on the screen but there are some real gems in this uh, this person's uh, explanation so look at their definition of hatred hatred means hatred against a person or a group of persons in the state and elsewhere on account of their protected characteristics or any one of those characteristics just imagine <laughs> if somebody says i really hate conor mcgregor for defeating so and so fighter is that hate speech now 
and meaning of protected characteristic now what is a protected characteristic race color nationality religion national or ethnic origin descent gender sex characteristics sexual orientation or disability what does gender mean gender means the gender of a person or the gender which a person expresses as the person's preferred gender or with which the person identifies and includes transgender and a gender other than those of male and female okay now this is the press release that ireland's department of justice gave their argument so they say the prohibition of incitement to hatred act 1989 has been widely considered as ineffective with only about 50 prosecutions in more than 30 years since it was enacted the 1989 act is being repealed and replaced with new simpler provisions designed to be more effective in securing convictions they basically want to shut down all criticism of anything related to hate speech but guess what if they go by these hate speech laws would real certain religious texts be protected under it or would they just you know be allowed think about it think about these questions it is it is terrible if, and if you i know a lot of my listener base hates my stand on on free speech or on hate speech you know why is ireland behaving the way it is i can tell you why ireland is behaving the way it is it is because of videos like this circulating on social media whether it is right whether it is wrong is secondary but people watch this kind of stuff and then they react to this listen to this You're an Israel supporter. Yes, sir. Broski. Wallahi, on the Holy Quran, I would actually smack your pussy head. Well, don't, don't be aggressive. Yeah, you heard it right. If you're a supporter of Israel, I'll slap you. And these things then circulate on social media, and people react, and then these politicians, they do what? They come up with a hate speech law. Now look at this political discussion. on what's happening in Ireland between a left wing journalist by the way this video is from the united kingdom what you saw that I, that accent was british not irish just wanted to let you know now okay just watch this discussion it's a 2 minute clip and you will just ask yourself yaar ye kya ho raha hai mere sath ye log kya baatein kar rahe hain just listen to this okay this journalistic discussion your website john mcgurk has received a lot of criticism this for reporting the news for choosing to highlight player. the nationality of the suspect in this night attack at a moment in time when there were hostilities in the in the in the uh, city center i'm wondering in what way did you feel his nationality had a bearing on this incident it was entirely relevant because as subsequent facts have shown he was somebody who came here was granted was was given citizenship after being issued with a deportation order and has never according to Sunday independent worked a day in his life it is relevant because of what happened with Joseph Puska what happened in Sligo with Yusuf Polani it is further relevant i would say i mean it's fascinating that i'm being asked this question because no one is saying the story was untrue essentially the story no, not, essentially no i never i'm not didn't say it's untrue i asked you what its relevance was yeah it's, it's essentially the position now seems to have gone from you know we're worried about misinformation and disinformation to all of a sudden you can no longer report true information or you're whipping up fear And so I, w- I would question your fellow journalist. We're ta- we're discussing journalism. I would question you. What power do you have, Kira, or any journalist have to decide what fact the public should or should not know? I'm not saying you're they have. You, so I'm saying what journalists I'm, I'm do extreme, have, I'm John McGurk. Ha- what they do have, John McGurk, is responsibility. For what? That's what journalists have. Not to overheat and an already not to overheat situation. and inflame an already hostile situation. That's so responsibility. Your, 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 what your essential position is. is that you as a journalist sitting in that chair should decide what information the people watching this program have and if you decide that they can't handle it you don't give it to them in this okay. case the information was true it was relevant well. okay, it is utterly okay, nonsensical to suggest that the discontent in the inner city at the moment is because of a lack of community police officers if that is what our political class think then they should all go it is nothing to do with that it what it is more about the discontent that we saw on Thursday is about communities that have not been listened by any of these three people okay so I, 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 I'll be honest about, with you John McGurk I don't know if everybody would call What we saw on Thursday discontent. Mm-hmm. It was widespread what, what violence would, and looting. What, what else would you call it? it widespread I'm, violence. I'm, 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 you're putting I'm, I'm, words in our mouth here, I'm, right? Okay. I, I, no, no, I didn't no, put any no, words. No, in. Okay, I'll stop over here. But you guys get an idea 
of how the discussion is skewed and when discussions are skewed like this then what is the subsequent result of that now that is a question people need to ask right so one article that i studied and see you just have to go by polls and survey data there is no other way to have any other uh, rational approach yeah you can say i saw one video anecdotes are something that i don't believe in i don't share anecdotes i share anecdotes to make a larger point if i can back it up with data and this is the european social survey and europeans are becoming more divided on immigration key findings of the 19 countries where data was collected in 2002 3 only austrians and those from czech republic think that migration made a country a worse place to live in both 2002 3 and 14 15 denmark sweden finland are the most positive towards immigration and the czech republic hungary portugal the most negative but if you keep looking up and you read further down the line the changes in this society this is from 2016 why did i show this first because i wanted to go, to show that this was the baseline in 2016 but oh boy have things changed in that part of the world as you see now if you remember four countries have already elected proper right wing leaders get that the trend is changing these people are going look even in france marine le pen it's not like she's a minority vote holder she gets a significant vote like i said in germany even the far right is getting so much so many votes in germany and people should worry about these things now there are many other you know baselines that you may not like but these things are discussed these things are discussed in every single household or for this daily mail the islamic extremists are taking over uk prisons muslims make up just 1 in 20 britons but 1 in 7 inmates as levy belfield embraces islam we reveal how fanatics recruit behind bars in jihadi jails this is an article from 2016 once again this is 7 years ago what do you think is happening today why am i sharing all this data from the past is because these are hard facts nobody wants to talk about them forget that let's talk about canada so this is a latest survey in canada okay this agency keeps doing regular surveys in canada it's very interesting the survey is titled it's by the angus reed institute it's called islamophobia in canada four mindsets indicate negativity is nationwide most intense in quebec i'm just going to show you the the charts right so the key findings are basically what did they ask whether canada has a problem with islamophobia canadians are evenly divided where 50% say it does and 50% say it does not more than 2 in 5 44% canadians believe it is unnecessary to have a special representative on combating islamophobia a position recently appointed by prime minister trudeau 7 in 10 outside quebec support the wearing of hijab in public places while 28% oppose it in quebec more than half 55% are supportive while 45% oppose wearing the hijab now this is the bit where i wanted to talk about percentage of canadians who hold a favorable view of each religion right the most positive religion in canada pretty much is buddhism then christianity then judaism hinduism hinduism is pretty consistent across all right so in ontario it's 54% manitoba saskatchewan alberta british columbia it's pretty standard everywhere quebec basically quebec dislikes everyone <laughs> that's all i can say they they just like the buddhists they don't even like christians jews uh they like hindus more than the uh, jews uh, and almost as much as christian christians but look at the numbers for sikhism in quebec 24% and 25% for islam look at the overall number for islam in in canada rest of canada 35% bc 
yeah, Alberta, 35. Saskatchewan, 31. Manitoba, 30%. Ontario, 35%. The most populated state is Ontario, guys. And then ATL, 37. And Quebec, 25%. So what do you see over here? Islam has the lowest rating. After Islam, it's Sikhism. Judaism and Hinduism have pretty much similar ballpark ratings. Obviously, Christianity, because they still, Canada is 60% Christian. And Buddhism has the most positive rating as per this little latest poll. So I told you guys, Sikhism and Islam have a very negative rating amongst polling data. And by the way, even in India, you know, as per the NCRB data that was last released, uh, or uh, I remember the Times of India report that, uh, you know, in Maharashtra, at least I remember 30% of all the under trials in the state were, uh, oh, wait, I have the article. Let me show you uh, the chart itself of under trials and uh, what is the state of affairs this is 2016 for clarity under trials 30 percent muslim convicts 20 muslim population 12 tamil Nadu 16 convicts 17 muslim population 6 gujarat 22 percent of the population is under under trial is muslim 10 percent is the state population west bengal 47 percent Convicts, 42%. Population of the state, 27%. So as you see the trend, now you can take two conclusions of it, out of it. If you're a left finger, you're going to say rampant Islamophobia. The state is targeting Muslims. But is West Bengal a right-wing state? Is Delhi a right-wing state? Tell me, so many of these states are not controlled by BJP. Even those states have only one trend line, ladies and gentlemen. The population of Muslims in the state is less. But the share of Muslims in the crime in India is relatively high. We need to ask these questions before, before crazy far-right people who have crazy third-rated ideas start asking them, why did I use Europe as an example? Because that scares the shit out of me. It literally scares the living daylights out of me. Because the left has stopped asking these questions, kind of cuckoo people, not all, but some on the right are asking these questions. I mean, I saw an absurd video that even in Japan, they have anti-immigrant rallies now. I saw an absurd video. I have not been able to verify the veracity of that video. So I did not share it. But how many of you remember this brilliant discussion that the Vice had shared? You remember this video? How many of you remember the Vice video? I'm just playing a 48 second clip. Where do you think that women who are in abusive relationships should go for help? Abuse against women. There are only accusations. The women's and men's rights are clear. No, we are all Do you think that it can ever be justified for a man to beat his wife? He can and may beat her without leaving any marks on her. Because he beats her too hard, he can take her to court. Should women be allowed to do your job and preside over cases and to determine what justice is? I don't think a woman can be a judge. Why? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it right. These videos, what did I, why did I mention the importance of living in a post social media world? You live in a world where these videos are circulated. They come all the way to India. So what do you think they are ha that's going to happen in those countries? They must be rampant on WhatsApp, on Signal, on Telegram, on all those platforms. And then you have the Irish people in the political class making ridiculous statements like we need more hate speech laws so that all these people who are doing this need to go to jail. What do you think is going to be the response? And then you have a superstar like Conor McGregor now coming into the fray. It only makes things worse, which is why I say, 
you want to deal with this problem, reject third rated models like the salad bowl theory. The melting pot is still better than the salad bowl. But like I said, all cultures are not equal. If you want to have a better society, you need to define certain cultural non-negotiables. Like there have to be certain cultural non-negotiables that I am not going to allow this. If you want to come to my society, you're more than welcome, irrespective of your caste, creed, religion, ethnicity. That's how immigration policies across the globe should be there. That's 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 the only way out. But there have to be certain non-negotiables like women's rights. Men and women are equal. We do not discriminate between them. Women can wear what they want to wear, even a hijab, if they want to. But we are allowed to call a hijab a cloth bag because we think it's a patriarchal concept. There should be free speech. We should be allowed to criticize religion. We should be allowed to criticize all kinds of bad ideas, including religious ideas. We should believe in human rights. We should believe in individualism. And minorities can do their own thing until and unless they follow certain non-negotiables. The problem with the world is, the world is seduced by cultural relativism. A significant chunk of the world, including India. Why do you think you have these absurd policies in India? Because even Indian policy making is culturally relativist. Because if it was not culturally relativist, you would have a uniform civil code in India. You would call polygamy an inferior value which should go. You would call Nikah Halala an inferior value. Do you know the Anand Act the, which, which governs the Sikh law? If the Sikhs don't come under the Hindu Marriage Act, the Anand Act does not even have a concept of divorce. Did you guys know that? Did you know that the Christian code that is right now existing, do you know how hard it is for a Catholic woman to get a divorce in India? These are inferior value systems. You have to call out inferior value systems. If somebody believes that a Shudra should not enter a temple because he is or she is a Shudra, that person carries an inferior value system. And you should call it out. And immigration is now going to be designed as per this. I can guarantee you that it's going to be a global design. It's going to be tough because you can say people can lie on the immigration paper and walk back. Well, there will be clauses in immigration policies now, whether entering India, exiting India, wherever you go, where there might be a 10 year period where we are going to watch what you say on social media. And if you deviate from certain values, we will send you back. The old liberal order, which was based on face value, which was based on the assumption that, oh, these people will just blend into our society because we are so awesome. I can guarantee you those days are gone. Immigration policies are going to change because people are fed up of inferior values. Liberals who actually are the good ones in this battle, liberals in not in the sense how Indians understand it, like real liberals who believe in freedom, democracy, human rights, decent values, superior values. They are now speaking up. They're speaking up in India. They're speaking up in the Western world. All these liberals are fed up. Basically, they are fed up of being told all the time that, oh, they have a bad idea. That the culture of nikah halala or the culture of caste discrimination is equally relevant. No, these ideas need to be shunned and literally destroyed. Because if we don't do that, I can assure you, the response is going to be so nasty, so nasty that it scares me at times. It scares the living daylights out of me every time I think what is going to happen. If the left does not get its act together, literally, if the left 
does not get its act together we are in for a tough time ladies and gentlemen and and one last piece of evidence to back my claim because this is a latest mood poll okay this poll is very new so let me share the pdf look at this figure this is attitudes towards immigration in great britain 2023 The first question is do you think the number of immigrants coming to britain nowadays should be increased reduced or should remain the same look at the highest percentage 37% now say reduced a lot 15% say reduced a little 22% say remain the same 8% say increased a little 6% say increased a lot and 12% say don't know then look at this this is a bit of heartening sign on the whole do you think immigration is a good thing or a bad thing for britain 17% say very bad 16% say bad 30% say neither good or bad 23% say good but listen this is the trend this was a public opinion poll which was uh, conducted it was published on 28th 9 2023 from the center on migration policy and society you can go and download the survey from their website but these trends are changing and as someone who is actually a liberal who actually believes in liberal values someone like me i get worried when i study these trends and i look at these polls and and i ask myself the left has destroyed everything the left has destroyed which is why i say the indian policy of khichdi is better although india itself does not uh, follow it and india has absolute shit laws but at an epistemic level the only solution to this is you have to have a core value structure which your society has obviously every society will have cultural nuances and they will have certain cultural leanings but if you don't start saying that listen all cultures are not equal the culture of the taliban is not the same as the culture of india the culture of hamas is not the same as the culture of israel the culture of pakistan is not better than the culture of india on average the west has a superior culture if we stop saying these things we are going to destroy liberalism which is literally the idea that gave us a lot of good things in life you may not like it but women you have your rights because of liberalism do you know what all the free stuff that you enjoy all the beautiful things you enjoy because of free market capitalism that is because liberals thought of that liberals thought of a lot of good things and if you want to make sure that your life is good start speaking up as a good liberal start speaking up you don't like the word liberal because you think it has western connotations my people in india call it what you want but demand better values because if you do not demand better values the things that we built over a period of 100 200 years they could go away so take that and stop apologizing for bad cultural values you don't need to hide it you should say bacha bazi is a bad value you should say nikah halala is a bad value you should say casteism is a bad value you should say racism is a bad value you should say misogyny is a bad value you have to start saying these things because if you don't say it the far right will say it in the worst way possible and when the far right says things it leads to pogroms i lend there i'll take your questions now and then i'll wrap it up okay how about this kushalism the religion of well being 93.99.k 3k followers and growing towards 100k hey thank you very much but i am not interested in starting any new cult or any new religion uh, i am happy the way i am i am very uh, good uh, i i think uh, the hindu identity is enough for me i know you were saying it in a tongue in cheek way but i still want to make it clear i am very fine with my hindu identity um and you know i'm comfortable there rajesh sharma thank you very much for becoming a member uh, please watch the recent black hole talks all hope evaporates the elite are teaching the youngsters a new load of lies and distorted facts uh, i have not checked it out i'm so sorry that i have not checked it out um but uh, if you could be more specific can you email me maybe i mean i don't know i mean what am i going to check out right 
So if you could email me, I may not reply, but I'll definitely read your email. So I'll appreciate that. Thank you very much in advance. Did you find any wrong things in the Upanishads? I heard there is some part 5, 6, Shilakanda in Brihadaranyaki Upanishad, where, which are later add-ons. Should they be considered part of Upanishads? Well, if they are being printed, then they are a part of the Upanishads. And what's the big deal, man? Even if there is a bad part in the Upanishad, you don't have to agree with it. You can just say, I disagree with that value structure and uh, whatever, man. You can just move on. I mean, what's the big deal? Brijesh, thank you very much for becoming a member. What is Why is phobia popular? Use peril to be accurate. I mean, I don't know. You have to go and ask the, the people in the social science departments, right? Um, I mean, who am I to answer? So how should we reconcile with the fact that liberalism descended into wokeism? Do you think it is easier for the right to become centrist? Rutuj, I don't know if it is easier for the right or the left to become centrist. I think people are often under the misconception that liberalism went into wokeism. I just think atheism led to wokeism. I don't think so. It's necessarily liberalism that led to wokeism. And like I said, I'll explain this in detail in my book that it is actually atheism at a psychological level that leads to wokeism eventually. I mean, I know atheists will not agree with me and I'm fine with that. But yeah, I, I actually don't think it's necessarily a liberalism issue per se. I just think it is, uh, you know, it is a atheistic blind spot that a lot of atheists have. Uh, by the way, you guys, if you want, you can even ask your questions on Fanmo if you want to. And you can keep asking the super chats they pop up separately i'm also going to look at some random comments uh, in the in the stream if i find something interesting but obviously super chats will be answered first so i don't know if there are any questions in the random stream i'm going to go right up at the top uh, and then start uh, working towards the bottom and see if there are any other questions that i can answer because i always do so let me see by the way, uh, I apologize because today's uh, monologue crossed the 30 minute limit. But, kya uh, kare? So, um, I just don't, uh, I, I just felt I had to speak and, and clarify this. Mm. Mm. See a lot of comments, not questions. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, let me see again. A lot of comments, no questions really. I'm trying to scroll as fast as possible. Mm, 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 mm. Boy, people have a lot of comments. Nobody has questions. So somebody has asked, guess why West Bengal is at the bottom? Listen, I don't know. But everybody knows is all I can say. <laughs> Just attitude towards women if people are wondering what I'm talking about. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know what to say about that. Are these purely cultural reasons or are there economic reasons? I think a bit of both, cultural and economic. But it is primarily when you let bad ideas fester, people eventually cling on to them, bad ideas. I think it's a cultural problem. It's a, it's a, it's a giant milieu of bad ideas that have been festering way too long. And nobody has challenged them because the thing was that the old orthodoxy, which was basically centrist left and centrist right across the world, they thought we won, who cares, you know, Sanuki kind of a thing. And they just did not pay attention. How hard it is for Catholic women to get divorced in India. Go read up articles on this. Even Outlook India has covered this stuff. Go read up articles on this. Basically, Padri ki madat nahi hogi na. Just read up on this. Everybody keeps talking about, you know, <laughs> Muslim ideas, Muslim this, Muslim that. Boy, is there bigotry in every single sect in India. 
I'm not giving Muslims a free pass, but boy, is there bigotry. Oh my God. It is like freaking insanity. Again, how do I know all of this is because while I was writing my book, I was researching every civil law in India because, you know, there is a major chunk in my book where I'm going to criticize India because, you know, as an Indian, I have to criticize my society. I praise my society, but I criticize it. And then I started looking at, you know, other religions beyond Hinduism. And I was like, my goodness, what the hell? Wait for my book. You're going to get a shock of your life. When you read the absolute garbage women have to face in India. And then there are people who don't support the Uniform Civil Code. Okay, somebody has requested, please call an Indian ex-Muslim like Sahil, Samir, Azad, uh, ground. This can help in getting clarity on Islam versus Islamism. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll definitely consider that. Kushal, from my experience in Dublin, the local white population can't generally differentiate between Indians and Pakistanis, Hindus and Muslims. The problem it is creating for even the good immigrant. Thank you for raising this point, Naman. Can I, I, I can't thank you enough. This is why I'm saying far right bad, Naman. Why do you think I keep saying far right bad? It scares me. Center right is fine. Far right is dangerous. But look at what is coming in Europe. Far right. You should be scared because you remember uh, in my podcast with Haris Sultan, I said something in Punjabi that hum, jaise we find all white people to be the same. They will think all brown people are the same. Or what do you think? Who's going to get beat up? Innocent people. And who's responsible for this? These people who don't want to talk about problems in their society. So thank you for raising this question. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> India is suddenly going to be very concerned about human rights in Europe after 2024. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, we have another super chat. If Quran is infallible, how will Muslim come to terms with parts that are uh, genocidal, hateful, misogynistic, or just compatible with the modern world? How, how did uh, every other religious person come to terms with it? Do you think uh, the Old Testament does not have genocidal verses? Do you think uh, there are no sexist or misogynistic verses in Hindu texts? How do they come we compartmentalize. We ignore the bad parts and take the good parts. Every religion is going to have to. Now, before somebody uh, comes and says, but Quran is the absolute and final word of God, who cares? You think people really follow that? Human beings are hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. It's just our degrees of hypocrisy vary. That's all it is. Mm. what about Argentina isn't that also a great example how hyperinflation brought the right to power oh yes Shubhankar very good point I, I agree with you Argentina is slightly different but listen to that guy's views also he got some crazy views by the way this guy is like slightly cuckoo He's an anarcho-capitalist, libertarian, by the way. Like he's the libertarian on steroids version. <laughs> mm. Okay. Kushal being right-wing is against Hindu ideas, right? An eye for an eye will make the whole wild blind, right? If the world becomes liberal-minded. Listen, I think you, it, there's nothing wrong in having fiscal conservative ideas. Fiscal conservatism is a right-wing thing in economics. So I would not 
agree entirely with you the point is that can we respect human life and yes at the end of the day we always have the popper's paradox that how much do we tolerate bad ideas and like i said it is time to stop tolerating bad ideas we have to say that these ideas are inferior and uh, we will not tolerate them that's that it's as simple as that you have to stand up and say some ideas are just bad why is my channel named charvaka uh, because i follow the charvak darshan that's why sir hmm Mm, let's see. Mm. Why are Indian descent foreigners like Indo-Americans or Anglo-Indians or Canadian Indians left-leaning? Listen, that was the cultural um, orthodoxy when a major chunk of immigration has happened, and you just go with the flow. Uh, that is one of the reasons, and. Uh, maybe after that you can assert it to this because the minorities and the left has been historically in the last few years been pro minorities so it's just a natural thing to go there that could be one of the reasons there is a rising trend in hinduism towards exclusivism regarding some particular deity or other without naming any particular denomination do you see illiberal trends infecting the structure of hindu society now once again i i would really take this opportunity to thank the person who has asked this question uh, ravi mr ravi chandran uh, i i i seriously mean this i really appreciate uh, it's a beautiful question it's a very important question and i can't thank you enough for asking this question um uh overall indian society is becoming better on trends on polls but what has happened now ravi ji is that we see a, a very loud faction on social media that keeps peddling bullshit keeps peddling rubbish ideas keeps peddling ridiculous thoughts and we are being fed that on our timelines all the time whether on twitter or through youtube videos absolute rubbish absolute bigotry against muslims absolute bigotry against sikhs and uh, absolute bigotry against sometimes against brahmins where if you go to dravidian discourses absolute bigotry against uh, you know dalit communities if you go to certain general category wale log it's ridiculous and this this is all driven ravi ji by a trend that clicks get you money and people are willing to sell their soul for a bit of youtube money these are just facts sir i am very sorry to say but the overall trend line of society is different this is what is happening every time ravi ji we look at polls done in india we see society is balanced but then the reality on social media is disturbing and which is why it is the duty of people like you or me that every time we see bigotry we should call it out let's not matter if it is bigotry against hindus against dalits against brahmins against muslims against christians we have to learn to distinguish between ideas and individuals i all which is why i always talk about islamism i talk about bad ideas i don't generalize the entire community even in this monologue i was very careful with, and and i agree with you that there is a certain section which is very illiberal and those people need to be called out i am 100% with you you have an ally in me at least in this battle against illiberal ideas you advise to simply uh, move on and deny if one spots problematic verses but doesn't a singular inferior thought negate the whole scripture or values it promotes no it doesn't because when you do a meta analysis of an entire scripture right you do a meta analysis okay think like this um you create a a quantitative analysis of a of a text so you give points to misogyny minus 2 i'm just giving you a hypothetical right uh, you don't have to give minus 2 i'm just telling you misogyny minus 2 uh, bigotry minus 2 xyz uh, pro this plus 2 and and then you do the whole analysis and then you decide what that text stands for 
and you will be surprised a lot of religious texts will go in the negative old testament and a lot of those texts and then after that you should have an opinion but many religious texts in my experience still go in the positive too so there is there some book recommendations for israel palestine i'm not the right guy because i've not done a deep dive uh, um, on israel palestine which is why i call other people so uh, but uh, email me or uh, reach out to abhijit i guess he can give better answers i'm not an expert on israel palestine you know someone you guys should look at for israel palestine uh, he has come on my podcast a long time ago his name is jaydeep prabhu j a i d e e p space p r a b h u he is an expert on israel go and check out jaydeep's work he's come multiple times on the podcast someone i deeply respect one of the brightest minds brilliant guy phd check his work out jaydeep prabhu he will give you great recommendations and i think he is on social media if i remember his handle is uh what was his handle sala jaydeep ka handle kya tha main bhool gaya hu abhi some orso or something o r se kuch tha jaydeep ka handle uh but yeah you should follow him uh next question was how to avoid hindu sgpc in future when temples are free oh boy what a question can i take this question as a separate question in a discussion that i plan to do next month if you don't mind abhishek kapoor can you email me this on my email id <laughs> because this should be a detailed question by itself in another podcast so can i do that i i apologize please email me this question because i'm doing a temple freedom and casteism podcast very soon so please email me this question and when i do that podcast everybody who is watching this live right now this is my humble request to you you guys remind me of asking this question how to avoid hindu sgpc in future when temples are free please this is my humble request to all of you because i think this would make a great question for that podcast so please this is my request I have observed that xenophobia is ubiquitous in India. Each region and religion has a derogatory term for everyone across the country. What do you think? Yes, it is there. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to say that it, despite all of these things, Indians are also quite warm people, and and uh, they are also equally accepting. <laughs> they have both sides. It's a very weird sort of a society, and it all stems from that khichdi. mentality that indians have they call each other names they still let the person come it's a very weird sort of a society it's a, uh, i would say it's a complex society india but yes i i i understand what you're saying but all societies have words for each other you should go to the united states of america they also have words uh, for 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 each other mm let's take other questions all right I think I've covered everything. Yeah. Somebody has asked, "What is SGPC?" Well, SGPC is the Shiromani Gurdwara Prabandhak Committee. It's an institution that controls Sikhism today, and uh, I'm not a fan of it. That's all I can say. Mm. I'm just making sure that I have not missed any questions and. there is nothing there just checking other links nope i have not missed anything i think i've pretty much covered all the questions oh my god why is one person spamming so much it makes my life so hard mm. 
Okay, this is a good question by Mr. Sadat Khan. Can you handle criticism though? What if you become intolerant and others become intolerant in, of your idea? Then it will be a fight and you will need to intolerate. Uh, Sadat, uh, the thing is that I do handle criticism. I mean, I I host a reasonably, I'm not saying the most popular podcast, but I would say I, I mean, I have a reasonably popular podcast in India. I get criticized all the time. I handle it pretty well. So, as but as far as bad ideas are concerned, Sadat, you have to stand up against bad ideas. Because if you don't stand up against bad ideas, it doesn't matter where they stem from. Think like this, Sadat. If I don't stand up against casteism, discrimination against Dalits, or what the Dravida Munatela Kalgam does to Brahmins in Tamil Nadu, then they keep on doing it. And as a decent human being, I have to be intolerant to bad ideas. I cannot not be intolerant to bad ideas. But for that, Sadat, I have to start by the baseline where I accept there are bad ideas. And I have to reject cultural relativism. That's what I'm trying to say. But the problem with people is People refuse to accept that their culture could have bad values. I believe Hindu culture also has bad values. Christian culture has bad values. Muslim culture has bad values. But all cultures do not have equal values in terms of how bad or good. Some cultures have way more bad values than other cultures. And you have to face this reality. Until and unless you don't face this reality, you just cannot improve humanity and have a better future for everyone. That's the only way out of this. There is no other way out of this. Why did Sikhism remain restricted to Punjab? Many figures such as Panjipyare, Banda Bahadur were not Punjabis. Well, it's just a geographical thing that uh, a particular community stayed there and they were never, there were no real economic reasons or socio cultural reasons for them to migrate out of Punjab, right? And they pretty much stayed in that area. But you have to understand what was Punjab. At one point of time in India, the state of Punjab was Punjab, Haryana, Himachal, and the entire region of Pakistani Punjab. That was all Punjab. That's a giant area. Why would they have to go out? Punjabis don't have to go out, right? Okay, how do we prove a culture has bad values than other? You test it on human flourishing. Very simple. That does one culture under which, let's say, culture X uh, gives equal rights to women. Culture X gives all these things that I have just mentioned before. That lets, le leads to more human flourishing, more prosperity. Those are superior values. Culture Y says, Bacha Bazi is fine. Marrying a 10-year-old is fine. Do you think that leads to human prosperity and human flourishing? These are bad values. So it's very simple. This culture has objectively better values than the other one. <laughs> Somebody has asked, Kushal, Charvaks are all about money. So why did you close your factory? Uh, I know you, you have asked this in a tongue-in-cheek way. But I will give you a serious answer. Uh, I was actually doing very well financially, even my factory. It was doing very well. But I came to a point in my life where I just got bored. I, 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 and I just felt that I guess I was meant for different things. And I just took this plunge. And if people who know me personally, know my financial background personally, they often tell me that I'm crazy about taking such a huge financial hit where I just go from this level to, you know, coming down and literally starting from scratch and building this up. And even in that, I don't cut corners. I look at the way I run my podcast. I don't do ad reads. I don't do unethical things. Even on this podcast, I, I have, you know, my, you know, the person who designs all the thumbnails or creates the shorts, you know, the, the poor soul has to go through so many rules that I have created that you cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. 
and the poor guy has to work in that because see what is the standard model of youtube negative verbs in the title talk about either things that people want to hear which is loosely called positive affirmation or just pedal doomsday scenarios everything is getting destroyed and that's what gets you clicks right this is the basic standard model of youtube that's all people do either positive affirmation or doomsday scenarios i do neither i today i'm talking about cricket tomorrow i'm talking about something else it's just a lifestyle i have chosen i did not start this podcast that i wanted to be a millionaire or something i started this podcast is because i was reading consistently since the year 2001 and there were a lot of things that are there inside me that i just felt i will share if people like it fine if they don't they will reject it i am not attached to this beyond a point i love the idea of engaging with people i love the idea of learning constantly and i am doing that i i know your question was uh, tongue in cheek and i appreciate the humor but uh this is the serious answer of why i did what i did and <laughs> i am i'm actually not that much of a, you know paise ka lalchi i like money i make money i believe in making money i believe in being rich also but the point is that i also believe in being ethical and i believe in working within ethical boundaries and i leash myself that way and my growth will be slower i will have lesser subscribers i will have lesser views i will have lesser things but i will sleep very well even today i sleep very well please talk about the nit shrinagar incident another blasphemy nonsense drama blasphemy law should be removed by bjp oh yaar aap sit dave aap mere ko ek baat batao how many people in india agree with me to remove blasphemy be honest you are clearly not living in india because your money has come in a currency that is not indian right tell me how many people are going to agree with this i keep saying i keep mentioning uh the same shit again and again and i will go on saying it again and again but tell me how many indians even understand that without free speech there is nothing without the freedom to think and the freedom to speak you literally have nothing you literally have nothing so what do i do i don't know man i just keep talking about it i just keep mentioning it keep fighting the good fight and hope that one day people inside the bjp people inside uh, the overall political class actually agree with it but indians don't believe in free speech yaar kya kare hum they just don't they think controlling people controlling their mouths controlling their thoughts is actually good for the society kya kare abhi i mean i I, I'm sorry if I have given you a bad answer. That's all I can say. How does one abandon non-intentional biases? Listen, you know I get these questions randomly all the time. I am now at a stage that I can't answer them in one go. I might end up, you know, creating a detailed course which I am thinking of designing in 2024 of actually how to think critically. because uh, at the end of the day in the last two decades or so of my reading i mean i think that's all i have achieved thinking critically trying to control you cannot get rid of your biases you control your biases and uh, that reaching that level of epistemic humility is a constant process you have to do it daily you have to do it daily so i'm trying to figure out like a larger course structure where i actually teach a few things and then i wheel it all together and eventually when somebody goes through the journey of that course um you know you will eventually understand critical thinking pr will make changes against khalistani and islamists his party looks compromised uh when you say 
what changes i mean it's a very loose question like you have to be more specific will they ban sikh immigration no uh but their response to violence well it depends again certain issues are state issues certain issues are federal issues certain issues are local issues so when you have an issue in surrey british columbia it is a surrey matter and a british columbia matter what is the you have governance is decentralized in canada just like in america it's about it mm response to violence i think there will be a better response if there is violence committed but again you have to understand law and order is not a federal subject law and order is a state subject it's a state subject so you have to ask your state governments what are they doing your city police your mayors city mayor aapko to usko puchna hai na unko pucho those are the people you need to answer i uh, about to seek answers from i'm sorry i misspoke but yeah what do you do mm. all right i think i've pretty much answered every single question mm hmm mm my views on the two tier police system in the united kingdom um who would support that it's ridiculous it's ridiculous who would what kind of apps do you use for note taking and knowledge database management i actually don't use any app i still use a, a good old laptop i make folders and i put things in folders that's how i do it i'm very ancient <laughs> in 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 my uh, working methodology uh, yeah so kanav has asked a question if rishabh pant is fit enough should he be in lineup for the t20 world cup yeah he has to be in the squad right i mean can you leave a champion like pant out but then how many wicket keepers are we going to take like we have kl we have rishabh we have ishan holy moly who are we going to take i think kl has to be sacked sacrifice for t20 i think ishan and rishabh are the two people in my view from t20 standards that's what i would say recommend a book for december mm, okay you know what there are four books that i am reading and doing podcasts on pick any one of those four books that i'm going to do podcasts on in december on the podcast they they are all worth reading will india be better off with a two party system no not necessarily i think we can have a multi party system i think it gets a better representation of different communities and different groups i think there's nothing really wrong with our system as the european governments are cracking down on islamist immigrants i'm a bit concerned as i'm going to uk next year to study so will that reluctantly uh, towards immigration overflow listen you're lucky you're indian and most of these governments are not going to stop immigration from india why because a india is a democracy b they need indian immigrants because we are educated uh, we don't do crimes because if you look at uk uh, like i said indians are not the ones who are doing all the crime it's the pakistanis and the bangladeshis who are in jails the indians are making money <laughs> skilled people so in that sense in uk it's not going to be an issue in my opinion or in europe in general but yes the problem is because like i said those podcasters um don't um acknowledge the problem of islamism you're going to have a situation uh where these far right folks in europe are going to create problems for you which really saddens me and those far right people unfortunately will not know who you are 
like listen even indian muslims when they go outside india they don't do any ruckus they're not involved in this rubbish it's always the you know in france is the algerians i think in uk is the pakistanis and the bangladeshis uh in 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 some other area it's someone it's never the indian muslims that are involved they're just like indian other indians they just go get a job live a good life merge with that society what do you do it is what it is it's it's a mess and <laughs> all of us are believe me a person like me i am as scared of the far left as i am of the far right i'm scared of both and the far right turn the europe is taking everybody should be very wary of that it's not good it doesn't mean that we should let the left govern but it also doesn't mean that we should be celebrating these far right entrances i mean do i see a real right wing party in india in the next 20 years oh i don't see a real right wing party in india for the next 40 years not at all never not in india at least anyways so guys i guess we can wrap uh, the discussion up now uh, once again thank you very much for all the questions once again i want to remind everyone this this particular question by abhishek kapoor about the sgpc and hindu temples becoming sgpc please email me that question i i otherwise i will forget and uh, for the rest of the questions thank you very much thank you for all the support that you have given to the charvak podcast once again i want to request each and every one of you if you can please join the membership program of this podcast because that's what makes this podcast survive whether on youtube or on patreon or on fanmo if you can please join the membership program if you can send your donations if you want to send one time donations send them through upi to kushal mehra at icici if you want to buy the charvak podcast merchandise you can go to kushalmehra.com/shop and buy the charvak podcast merchandise if you can't do any of that and you're an audio listener just leave a rating that's what you can do on spotify leave a rating and a review on itunes if you are listening on google podcast leave a rating over there wherever whichever audio platform you use and if you are watching this on facebook on twitter on youtube like this video subscribe follow comment and keep supporting heterodox ideas if you can because the strength of heterodoxy is that heterodoxy always has scope for orthodoxy orthodoxy may not always have scope for heterodoxy so it's just a superior system where it allows other ideas to come so anyways i'll see you guys next time take care bye bye all the best Thank you.